Hopefully you were uh, listening a few minutes ago as we were reading from the fourth chapter here of uh, this amazing prophetic book as we find uh, a country boy who was sent north to prophesy against the northern kingdom of uh, Israel. He was actually from the southern kingdom of Judah and he was just minding his own business and tending to sycamore fruit and taking care of some small little old sheep-like animals and then lo and behold God said I got you a, a job to go north and prophesy against all the mess that's going on up north and he dropped what he was doing and he went and he fulfilled his commission and what we have in the reading a few minutes ago from the fourth chapter is uh, a revelation of the attitude that God possessed towards an apostate people who happened to be his Notice how many times in the context there that Amos, as he speaks for God, says, now this is what I did, trying to get your attention, but it didn't get your attention and you didn't turn back to me. So I tried this other thing. I tried giving you cleanness of teeth. And what do you think that means? Just, did he drop in uh, a bunch of toothbrushes? <coughs> did he give them some, uh, something to wash their mouth out? No, he took food away from them and sought to get their attention from not having anything to eat. And you would think that that would cause them to, to maybe reconsider their present position and maybe consider that the reason why they were suffering as they were for lack of food was because of their rebellion against God. But that didn't work. As a matter of fact, the whole list, and he begins, of course, emphatically talking about you fat cows of Bashan. Now, the God of heaven that many people consider to be the true God would never use language such as that, and yet that's exactly what God said. You fat cows. Now, whether he's talking only to the women, which is a possibility, or he's simply referring to the whole nation as being a bunch of effeminate women, even the men, and not doing the right thing, the principle holds true. They were engaged in doing all types of things. They were very busy. They were excelling in so many areas of commerce, but yet they were rebelling against God, and God is trying to turn the situation around so that they will not be carried into Assyrian captivity. Well, you know as well as I do that it didn't work, and so they were then taken into Assyrian captivity. But what we have in these few verses, <clears throat> excuse me, is the attempt that God is making to restore Israel. They need to be restored. They're walking contrary to God's will. God is not going to let them slide. And all of these things that he's doing is trying, attempting to get their attention, to help them to see that the reason why they're facing all of these physical catastrophes is because of the rebellion against Almighty God. And one of the things that he does is always beneficial. He tries to get them to see themselves as he sees them which just simply means he tries to get them to see their real condition, you know. Not necessarily what they want to see when they look in the mirror, but as even we would look into the mirror of the soul, the Word of God, then we can see ourselves just as God sees us. And really, ultimately, friends and brethren, is that not the, the right and proper way for everybody to see themselves is the way God sees them? Because it's only then that we can see that we've made a mess of our lives and need to straighten up so that God looks at us differently. And he will, if we'll simply learn the lessons and change and reform our lives. So that's the first thing he tries to get them to do. Secondly, he specifies some specific maneuvers that he's made to discipline them. You know, He's not going to allow them to go into captivity without punishing them in small ways so that they might avoid those big whippings like at the hand of the Assyrians. And so he exercises discipline on his people. I submit that parents understand that principle, or at least they should and could, because the Bible says that that's an obligation that parents have to their children. Sometimes those preliminary whippings will keep from big whippings having to take place. But if you bypass the preliminary whippings, you don't attempt to nip it in the bud. Don't be surprised if a beating is necessary later on. 
Well, that's exactly the way it was with God here. He attempted small discipline maneuvers in order to avert the common conclusion that they were going to reach at the hands of the Assyrians. And then he does this. He appeals to their common sense. Common sense, always in combination with Bible sense, is where we all need to be. Now, you cannot understand God nor his will by common sense alone, but once you have God's sense in his word, and then you apply good old common horse sense, then you can arrive at the proper conclusion as to what God wants you to do. That's what he does here. And he uses things that are not abstract. He uses things that they can see. He uses things that they can hear. He uses things that they can feel. And he even makes an appeal to their smell. Now, sometimes we leave that one out. But God doesn't hear. He says, there are things going on in your cities and the death of your young men is stinking to high heaven. And you still won't reform. Now, while probably we would uh, not take this as a blueprint for how we're to conduct ourselves in the work of the church, surely we can be impressed to the extent that God was willing to go in trying to reclaim his rebellious people. He was doing everything within his power to turn them back to the right way so that they would not have to be punished by a righteous God through the instrumentality, of course, of the Assyrians. And then, of course, the last verse says, listen, the creator and sustainer of the universe is in charge of this thing. Therefore, submit to me. I'm not just somebody out here saying something to be saying something. I'm talking about your eternal benefit and well-being. Thus, I need to be heeded seriously. Well, history records for us they didn't pay no attention. And because of that, they went into captivity at the hands of the Assyrians, and 99.9% .9 of them in the northern kingdom never returned. Never returned. See, it's not a very smart thing to not heed the wise advice of the God of heaven. And yet, that's a problem that oftentimes happens. It oftentimes happens. <clears throat> this is a picture or at least if you were to find out how to get on to Google, I just recently was able to do that. I know most of you have been able to do that for a long time. I just now can do that. And I typed into the Google space there, I typed parlor. 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 I can't even say it. It's too fancy for me to even say it. And here's what come up. A parlor. This is, I would say, probably a typical parlor. At least... Maybe it was a few years ago. Maybe different things be associated with it now than what we see in this display here. But this is what at least the previous generation would have classified in the general way as a parlor. And what is a parlor in here? Well, that's a place where you entertain guests, you know. You have this nice place. It's not in the kitchen, so you don't have the smells of the garbage can or the bacon frying or anything like that. You might even have some, some candles in here. It's a, a nice smelling place, a, a very entertaining and, and nice place to entertain guests. You, you come into the parlor, there may be a piano sitting over here, you know, and maybe a radio over here or something, you know, no television, mess up the, the atmosphere. But here's a parlor. But as you know very well, sometimes things can arise that ends up messing up a parlor. <laughs> the idea for this lesson actually comes from uh, a statement that was made by a sectarian preacher back in the late 1900s by the name of Billy Sunday. And he made this statement. He said, if you put a pole cat in the parlor, which changes first? The pole cat or the parlor? Think about that. You got this nice smelling, nice smelling, I mean, maybe everybody's got you know, brood on, you know, Old Spice, you know, women's got on their perfume. But then all of a sudden, here comes a polecat in the parlor. Which one do you think is more likely to change first? Well, it's obvious, isn't it? The parlor is going to take upon itself, even though it was sweet smelling just a few minutes ago, it is going to take upon itself the smell of a polecat pretty quick. Now, we know what a polecat is, too, or at least we should, you know. 
they populate the yellow lines on many highways in the state of Tennessee. It's nothing more than a skunk, you know. And a skunk has a unique ability to mess up the good smell of just about anything. Now, I know some people, some of them that I've told you their name, they know who they are. They actually claim to like the smell of skunks. They're lying through their teeth, you know. But yet they make that claim nonetheless. The smell of a skunk presently is being witnessed, is being smelt throughout our society. And the sweet-smelling parlors of our good country and even the institutions of this country, which used to smell very good, are presently beginning to stink because of the influence of that which is rotten, putrid and smelly to the core. We need to be concerned about that. Now, I know for a fact that if God would use the ability that a person has to smell, then it's proper for us to as well use that principle of smell to describe that which is at odds with his divine will for us. Not only as God's people, but as a nation of people as well. For example, we're going to look in a few areas of this pole cat in the park. You know as well as I, and if, if you don't, it's because you haven't been paying much attention. You know that we have faced over the last 20 to 30 years, and maybe even longer than that, some radical changes in the way that our country and the institutions of this country do business. That's just a fact. It's not just affected the country as a whole. It's not just affected the political arena. It's affected our homes. It's affected the congregation of the Lord's people. It's affected every facet of our society, and the effect that has been forced upon our society is not good. As a matter of fact, you could boil it down and say it flat out stinks. It stinks because it's at odds with the aroma that we should be offering up to God, a sweet smell and savor that's acceptable unto Him. And anything that keeps that from happening is something that absolutely must be dealt with. And just as God, would use these various figures in the fourth chapter of the book of Amos to get the attention of the children of Israel so that they can avoid captivity. Then even so, the principle applies to us as well in this day in which we live. In many instances, the door has been left wide open and the polecats have run in and took, took up residence right here in the midst of that which at one time smelled a whole lot better than it does presently. And friends, it doesn't take a Solomon, and since we're quoting from Amos, it doesn't even take Amos. Amos never claimed to be the wisest man on earth. He was just a, a, a plain old simple farmer that had a message from God. But it doesn't take any of that great intellect of these two men to recognize the fact, and provably so, that we're facing catastrophic changes in our society to the extent that many right-thinking and well-meaning parents and grandparents are worried about the future for their kids and grandkids. And rightfully so. You see, when I look at the situation and I wonder, reckon what I would do if I was 30 years younger, or 40 years younger, or 50 years younger. What would I do? How would I stand up under the pressure to conform or else be ridiculed and laughed out of many situations that exist in our world? What about our kids? And while we don't want to sell them short or leave the impression that they'll not be able to handle the difficulties that come their way because God's people have always had the ability to do that, wouldn't it be a whole lot easier if they did not have to deal with so much of the garbage that they presently have to deal with and that can only get worse in the future? That's my concern, and that's one of the motivations for this particular lesson. We're going to look at four different parlors. And the skunks of plenty that have invaded these parlors and the lesson will be yours. Let's look at first area. And I think it's only proper and right. Just to start in a, in a general broad way and then narrow our focus as we go along. We're going to talk about first the parlor of law and order and social justice. Hmm. I'm not talking about a television program that was on television for a number of years and now... You can see it just about every day because now it's available 24-7 uh, on various... I'm not talking about that law and order. I'm talking about what used to characterize this nation as regarding law and order and the social justice that went along with that. That was just common. It was accepted as so because those words actually meant something at one time. That's what I'm talking about. But sadly, a skunk has entered the parlor of law, order, and social justice. 
Now think about how out of, out of uh, reality this passage is from the wise man Solomon in Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 11. Listen to it. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Now that's just a fancy way of saying when crime is not punished and punished speedily, quickly, after it's occurred, then there's not going to be that warning and that punishment that stands above and beyond those that are facing doing the very same things that should have resulted in the hand of punishment coming down. Now, this is not just a, a problem that exists in our day and age, but you know as well as I do that there was a period of time in the not-too-distant past in which people actually had to pay for the crime. That there was such a thing as justice that was attempted to be served in the courts of law in the United States of America. And we was only concerned about that because that's where we live. But it used to be the case that law and order prevailed. There was such a thing as the rule of law. And to violate law meant you had to pay for it. It may cost you money, it might cost you freedom, it might cost you life if you were guilty of a capital crime. But sadly, we have to say that that simply is not the way it is in many respects any longer. Why is that? It's because the polecats entered the arena. The polecat is coming to the parlor. Swift and prudent punishment of the evildoer? Are you kidding me? No. Swift punishment of the evildoer? It's not happening. Instead, there's a greater respect for the criminal than there is the person who has been on the receiving end of the criminal's work. They have more rights than the person who has been done wrong by the criminal. What about victims' rights? You know, let me ask you this. Since we have taken this situation on uh, four square, I mean, we've really hit this head to head, then things are going to turn around quickly in the future. How many people believe that? If they do, they do it in spite of the fact that everything in the world points to the contrary. Do you think it might get worse before it gets better? <coughs> and then sometimes you think, at least not too many years ago, it couldn't get any worse, but it has. Where a criminal has more rights than the victim of the crime. And we're not talking about Russia either. We're not talking about Cuba. We're not talking about North Korea. We're talking about the United States of America. I wish this wasn't the case, but friends and brethren, you know as well as I that crooked lawyers, liberal judges, and sadly, a silent population, which so many times, sadly, we're a part of it, has allowed it to get like this. So the situation has been ideal for a polecat to come in under our very noses so many times because of a fear or a, a, a lack of concern for getting involved or who knows what, maybe, in, maybe being intimidated that we fail to open our mouth and speak up <clears throat> for what's right and what's good. The polecats of the liberal left have hijacked our constitution. That's a fact. They harass law-abiding citizens and, sadly, naive people are deceived and keep on putting them back in office over and over and over and over again because they're promised an extra dollar. Polecats in the park. <clears throat> All that remains, well, it's the smell. It's a smell. And the smell is as bad as the middle of the highway on any Tennessee highway where a skunk has been run over for sure. Now, just think of an example. There's thousands of examples we could use, but just think of one that's pretty recent. You got this fellow that goes into a gay nightclub down in Orlando, Florida, <clears throat> and he kills all these people. And the Department of Justice removes any designation like Islam, jihadist, or radical Islam from the transcript of what took place and the motivation behind it in that gay bar. Now why'd they do that? What's well, called political correctness. 
And friends and brethren, political correctness stinks because it's not calling things by their proper name. It's leaving an impression that's simply not there. It's promoting a idea that is not tied to reality. It's a fantasy world. And sadly, we're having to observe it every bit. And oftentimes be the recipients of the injustice that goes along with it. Sadly, sadly. Isaiah chapter 5 verse 20 will always apply. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. That put darkness for light and light for darkness. That put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. To call good bad and bad good is a terrible thing to be guilty of. And yet that's exactly where we are in our society as it relates to right and wrong, good and bad, truth and error, what we ought to do and what we ought not to do. It's a reversal of the terminology to properly designate those things. And here's where we come in as it regards this or anything else. Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. That means simply to show that it's wrong and how it's wrong. Now, if we can't do that, we need to get busy so that we can do that. And we do that at every opportunity. It's not just another way of looking at things. It's the wrong way to look at everything. And we can, with a book, chapter, and verse, expose the forces of evil, even in the realm of law and order and social justice. Second area, the parlor of ethics and morality. <clears throat> has a skunk got in there any time lately? Well, sure it has. In Galatians chapter 6, beginning at verse 7, Paul says, Be not deceived. Now, you can always note that whenever you see a passage of Scripture that begins like that, the likelihood is, is that somebody, somewhere, is going to be deceived. And so, to catch their attention, God saw fit to inspire men to say, Don't do it. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. He that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. He that soweth to the spirit shall of the spirit reap life everlasting. And then look at this catalog of sins. We have an extensive list of the Gentile world in Romans chapter 1, which includes everything that now is the greatest thing to come along since sliced bread and indoor plumbing and homosexuality and lesbianism and everything else associated with sexual deviancy is in the list here in Romans chapter 1. It's typical of those who refuse to retain God in their knowledge and give themselves up to a reprobate mind. Now, that's not the sentiments of a poor, confused, single man, the Apostle Paul. That's the words of the Holy Spirit, the God of heaven. That's what those words are. Those very same sins are, are leveled and the charge is made against them in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11. And interestingly, right here in the midst of the condemnation of sodomy, homosexuality, and feminine behavior is the fact that here were Corinthian brethren who at one time were guilty of those things. But now they're not. They're washed, they're sanctified, and they're justified. They quit being perverts. And they were applauded by the Holy Spirit because of that. And then, of course, the works of the flesh manifest, which are these in Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 through 21. Isn't it amazing that in these three long lists of sins, sadly in our world, we have to admit that the very things that are condemned in those passages, people glory in participating in them today. Do you realize there was a period of time in which adultery and fornication were abhorred? were looked down upon. It was actually called illicit sexual activity. Not just by members of the Lord's church, but by everybody that recognized there was in fact a divine standard and that is God's word. Do you realize it wasn't that many years ago that homosexuality was an absolute no-no, that nobody would parade that that's what they were, but it was something that people kept a secret because of its condemning nature. It wasn't that long ago either that gambling, instead of funding sec uh, secondary education, it was looked upon as a vice. But boy, we've made great strides to remove that handle on gambling, haven't we? And at one time in the not too distant past, drunkenness was not classified as a sickness, but as a shame to the one participating in society as a whole. Hmm. 
See, the very things that Paul sets forth in these three catalogs of sins, men today glory in their ungodly behavior and participation, all those things. But here's an interesting statistic I just found out this week. Gay males <clears throat> make up 2% of the population. Now, I realize a few years ago when the AIDS epidemic first began, the lie was promoted that 10% of the male population was gay. That's not the case. That's a lie. It's a lie. It's 2%. Now, what's amazing and sad is of that 2% of the United States population that is gay, they are afflicted with 71% of the AIDS cases. Now, isn't it amazing? That here we have effectively, and I say we, the powers that be in this country has identified the type of behavior that leads to the disease, but instead of encouraging people to quit the behavior that results in the disease, we have to spend bukus of money to try to come up with a way where people can keep on being perverts and not have the disease. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? You want to see a graphic example of our ethical failures? 40.7% of all births in the United States of America are out of wedlock births. So it says, wait, I thought it was more than that. Well, it's not. Non-Hispanic black, 72.2% outside of wedlock. American Indian, uh, Alaska Natives, 66.9%. Hispanic, 53.5%. Non-Hispanic whites, 29.4%. Now, if you feel a need to applaud that among the white population it's only a little less than a third, then don't do that too quickly. Because that's not anything to brag about. And concerning Asian and Pacific Islanders, it's 17.1%. When you put all of them together, that means that four out of ten children born in this country presently are born to unwed mothers. Sounds like to me that the experimentation that we've done in the realm of sexuality has resulted in a catastrophe that sadly many teachers are having to deal with day in, day out, and society can't deal with it. The third area is the parlor of the institution of marriage. Reckon there's been any stinking that has come into the room of marriage? Well, sure it has, obviously so. Remember in the 19th chapter of the book of Matthew, uh, a question is asked of Jesus in which Jesus, just as Paul is and does in uh, Ephesians chapter 5, Jesus goes all the way back to the beginning of the institution of marriage. Goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 2. And he says to these who consider themselves to be Bible scholars, have ye not read? Well, that was a direct affront to them right off the bat. What do you mean, have we not read? We know this book backwards and forwards. We know it inside out. Well, this shouldn't bother you too much then when the Lord makes it known to you what you should have already known, and thus no need for the question. Have ye not read that he that made them in the beginning made them male and male? That's no way he's saying. He that in the beginning made them female and female. That's no way he's saying. He made them in the beginning male and two or three or four or maybe even five female. Didn't say that either. He said, in the beginning, he made them male and female. And he said, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and cleave to his wife and be one flesh. What God therefore has joined together, let not man put asunder. Now that's from the get-go, God's plan for the institution of marriage. Well, how could the polecat invade the premises of this sacred relationship from the very beginning of time. Well, some people no longer view marriage as an institution that needs to be participated in. I mean, if you just have to, then go ahead, but don't expect anybody else to actually buy into this institution as being viable or to be anything necessary about it. Some have perverted the institution of marriage to the extent that they say it's not limited to, to uh, partners of opposite sex. It can be same-sex marriages, multiple partners, and in one case, in actuality, happened, and you might figure it happened in the state of Texas, a man actually married his horse. Friends, whenever you leave the divine objective standard of God's Word, then anything goes. 
when there is no such thing as right and wrong, then everything's wrong. The list goes on and on. But if you call it something else, if you simply call it the, uh, the ability that we're going to allow people to love the way they want to love and love who they want to love, it's still a polecat and still stinks to the high heaven. You can call it something else if you want to, but it still stinks. Last in this list is the parlor of the sacred and the holy. That's about as broad as I can make it. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 1, they had problems like this in the first century. They had to deal with it too. John says, Blood, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they be of God. For many false prophets are going out in the world. You mean there was false teachers in the first century? Yeah. Could it properly be described as that which they brought in to brethren as being a doctrine that smelled? Well, sure it did. It wasn't the true doctrine of Christ, and we know for a fact that those that abide in the doctrine of Christ have both Father and Son. Thus, if somebody brought in a doctrine that was not of Christ, then not only was it the wrong thing for them to believe, it would ultimately corrupt them eternally. That's where it stinks. It's no good. It's worse than worthless. But you know as well as I too how naive people are. It's amazing. It's mind-boggling. It seems that the more incredible, the more contrary to common sense that the thing is, the more people will run headlong in trying to promote it and be a part of it. It doesn't matter how silly it is. It cannot be too silly nor too contrary to the scriptures for there to be multiplied thousands and sometimes millions of people that will go headlong towards you. You know that as well as I do. I went to a lectureship up in Crossville uh, Friday night and yesterday, and one guy had, his sermon was on the plan of salvation. And so he had uh, a page out of, uh, uh, off of a website, the Book of Mormon, and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, so-called. And here was the plan of salvation of the Mormons, okay? And the very first thing it had on here was your pre-existence prior to you being born. That's the first point they want you to buy into. Is that before you were ever given a soul, you existed without a body and in some form on another planet. But there's just a handful of people that's Mormons, right? There's millions of people that are Mormons. The Mormons teach as God is now, so we shall be. And as we are now, God once was. And there's just a handful of Mormons. Yeah. There's millions and millions and millions of them. It doesn't matter how contrary to common sense of the scripture thing is, people will go headlong towards it. What's the problem? Well, the disciples asked Jesus in Matthew chapter 13 why he was preaching in parables. And he said, in essence, he preached in parables to reveal the truth to those that wanted the truth and at the same time to conceal the truth from those that did not want the truth in him. That's why he gave. And then he makes this statement as he quotes from the book of Isaiah. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Lest at any time they should see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and should be converted, and I should heal them. Now, the first time I read that, and every time since then, before I put this sermon together, I realized that Jesus left some aspect out that I want to include right here. Could it be that in addition to the fact that people have their eyes closed, in addition to the fact they've got their ears stopped, in addition to the fact that they've got cold, fat, hard hearts, they also have some type of nasal problem that causes them to be incapable of smelling that which stinks to the high heaven. Because it obviously does. It does. And the smell of air should be just as noticeable as that which we can see with eyesight. Tragically, tragically. Religious perversion has done more to discredit Christianity in the eyes of, blunt, in the, of an unbelieving world than any other thing. Now that simply means this. Denominationalism has done more to ensure that people stay lost than anything that man has ever come up with. 
because it gives a false sense of what Christianity is, it pacifies consciences, and it keeps people lost. The devil ain't got nothing any better going than it. And if that doesn't stink to you, then I submit that you've probably got a nasal problem as well. We cannot sit idly by while our country, while the Lord's church, while our friends and our family members are taken into apostasy and oblivion by the ungodliness that prevails presently in society. We've got to stand up and be counted for what's right and what's good, provably so, and we can do that. God has a simple plan. It begins with hearing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. We must believe that Jesus Christ is who he claimed to be so that we might repent of our sins, confess the name of Christ, and then be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, knowing that when we do, the Lord will add us to his church. Maybe in times past that simple plan you obeyed, but you've worn it away and gone back into the world. Why not jump at the opportunity this morning to come back home through repentance, confession, and prayer. The song has been selected that through its words we'll seek to encourage you as well. Would you come while we stand and while we sing? There's a soul, my